Today we're going to talk about the holy souls in purgatory, their primary suffering there, and what should we do about it and why we have an obligation to help them. So purgatory. The Church doesn't have too much to say on purgatory compared to its official teachings on other matters of faith and morals. So often we look to the saints and to the theologians and to the mystics and private revelation to gain a little bit more insight into purgatory. But briefly, this is what the Catechism teaches. All who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their salvation, but after death undergo purification, so as to achieve that holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. So what do we know? There is a holiness that is required to be able to enter heaven. Nothing unclean can enter heaven. So if we have sin upon our soul, attachments to this world, uh, self-love, that has to be purified in order for us to enjoy the beauty of heaven and, and perfect union with God. Now let's look at St. Faustina, her mystical experience of purgatory. One day her angel took her to purgatory. And she saw this great mist. And in this mist were the suffering souls. And she and she said her guardian angel never left her side for a moment. So she didn't suffer herself. But she asked these suffering souls, suffering souls, what their greatest torment was. And they said their greatest torment was not seeing God. Why? I mean, can you see God right now? I can't. And we seem to be doing okay. <laughs> Why is it that it's their greatest torment not to see God, but we tell ourselves at least right now, well, we're doing okay. And I'm just going to offer a couple little thoughts about that. Well, right now, we can easily distract ourselves. There's a restlessness within our hearts because the purpose of our life is union with God. We're made for relationship with Him. But when we ignore those desires within our heart, we ignore the objective truth of our life, we can kind of stuff, stuff away that pain. For example, we busy ourselves with work, we busy ourselves with worldly pleasures. And so oftentimes we just distract ourselves about the truth that we are made for reunion with God. And this restlessness within us sometimes gets stifled by all this other stuff we busy ourselves with. But in purgatory, there is no distraction. The soul is completely focused upon God and longing for God. So a soul cannot distract himself with the busyness of a worldly life, the, the run to the pleasures of the world. They are completely focused upon what they are created for, which is union with God. And when you are created for a love relationship and you can't have the fullness of that love, at least not quite yet, yet, isn't, doesn't that cause a suffering? I mean, we can understand that with a love relationship. Have you ever been in love? <laughs> I am. I love my wife. And I think back to the times that I used to fly a lot into the United States for parish missions. I'd be on the road. There's nothing that I hated more, and I really did hate this experience. When I go to the airport and I'd to fly home back to Canada, and I'd see my flight was either delayed or canceled. That meant I had to rearrange my my schedule to fly back home. And this delay, what would what did this delay? It delayed me reuniting with the one I love, which is my wife and my kids. And that suffering is real, and I think we can understand that when we are separated from the ones we love. There's pain. Now you are made, and I am made for union with God, who is love itself. I mean, God is, God's nature is love. And so a soul in purgatory is completely focused upon that, yet they cannot have the love that they are made for, at least not quite yet, the fullness of that. So there's this, the greatest suffering for the soul in purgatory. Is this, is this longing for God. And here in this earthly life, we have this longing for God. We do, but we distract ourselves with the busyness of the world, with the things, with pleasures. And so we stuff this away, but a soul is completely focused upon that. What else wants you to think about the purpose of your lungs? What are the purpose of your lungs for? To breathe. 
but we've all had this experience where we try and hold our breath as long as we can. And what happens? <gasps> we get to a point where we just gotta take in that next breath. Our, our lungs scream out for that breath. In fact, if we don't take that next breath kind of soon after that, we die. <laughs> now imagine a scenario where you hold your breath to the point of you just, you can't hold it any longer and you have to breathe again, but you can't. But you still experience this excruciating want for oxygen, but you can't have it. And yet you do not die. Perhaps maybe purgatory is like that. The soul is yearning for what it is created for, but it cannot have the fullness of that. Like the lungs screaming and longing for oxygen, air, the soul screaming for that love of God, yearning, wanting, but can't quite have the fullness of that. At least not yet. The greatest torment of the soul in purgatory, longing for God. So how bad is it? St. Thomas says, the most roaring furnaces, the most ardent flames to which martyrs were condemned are a mere shadow when compared to the devouring flames we must endure in purgatory. And it should be noted that those flames in purgatory properly understood are the purification of the soul so that the soul can be purified to see God. Now consider another suffering that these souls undergo in purgatory. Besides not being able to see God, they're helpless. They can't help themselves. They can't take that next breath. They can't see God. There's nothing they can do anymore to work out their salvation. They are dependent upon the mercy of God and prayers. Another suffering is besides being helpless, and have you ever experienced that feeling of helplessness in life when you're in a situation and there's nothing that you can do, but you're completely dependent upon others for your help? Well, consider the souls of purgatory and that suffering. But number two, not only are they, are they helpless, but so often they are forgotten. Just think about how many times you think about the souls in purgatory during your day. Most people, and I would place myself in this category and I want to change it, forget about the souls in purgatory. We should pray for them daily. Imagine being forgotten and in great need, completely dependent upon others for help and no one ever thinks about you. I mean, add that on top of your suffering. That's the position the souls in purgatory are in. So what can we do to help them? St. John Vianney said, consider then the magnitude of the sufferings which the souls in purgatory endure and the means which we have of mitigating them, our prayers, our good works, and above all, the holy sacrifice of the mass. So what can we do to help the holy souls in purgatory? St. John Vianney says we can offer our prayers, we can offer our good works, and we can offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Let's start with the prayers. What kind of prayers? Well, in your private devotion, offer the rosary for the souls in purgatory. Are you familiar with the chaplet of St. Gertrude for the holy souls in purgatory? It's linked at the end of this video. Private revelation to her says that when we say that 50,000 souls are released from purgatory every time we say that chaplet. Again, that's linked at the end of this video if you want to pray also in the description. We can also pray the litany for the faithful departed or litany for the poor souls in purgatory. It's also known as that. Again, linked at the end of this video also in the description. I wanted to give you some practical things that you could do. You could pray the, the chaplet of divine mercy. We have that one also linked in the description. But pray for the holy souls in purgatory. They're depending upon you. And think about this. If you help a soul in purgatory and your prayers are the ones that release them from the sufferings of purgatory, do you think they are going to be grateful? Do you think they're going to pray for you? I can't conceive that the soul who's been released from purgatory by our prayers is going to forget about us. In fact, I think we gain a friend for all eternity, an intercessor in heaven who will obtain grace for us that we otherwise might not have been open to because we didn't pray for them. And now because we pray for them, they pray for us and win great grace for us. So moving from prayers, what else? Two, good works. Jesus said to St. Gertrude, my mercy will accept a step a piece of straw, a word, a greeting, a prayer for sinners and for the just, as long as there is good intent. So basically, offer anything. 
<laughs> a step, a word, a greeting, your tasks during the day. What's the key? To have the intent, to have the good will when you're performing the action that this action is being done for the souls in purgatory. Now, who, which souls in purgatory? Well, why not pray for those that are in your lineage that maybe have been forgotten? I mean, you probably are aware of the people that have recently passed away in the last couple generations. Well, consider, could there be people in your lineage from hundreds of generations ago that are still in purgatory because they have been forgotten and they have had no one to pray for them? Yet you reap some of the benefit of their life. And one obvious thing is, well, if they didn't live, maybe you wouldn't exist. <laughs> You cut out a great, 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 great grandparent, you, you no longer are there. So at the very least, we owe to people in our lineage our life. Through the mercy of graciousness of God, we exist because God brought us into existence through them. So let's pray for them. And number three, we can offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass. St. John Vianney tells of this story where this priest had a friend who who died. And then later, it was revealed to this priest that his friend was still in purgatory. So the priest could think of nothing else but to offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass for his friend. So the next time he goes into Mass, at the moment of consecration, he's holding the host. And this is what the priest said. Eternal Father, let us make a trade. You hold my friend's soul in purgatory, and I hold the body of your son in my hands. Good and merciful Father, Deliver, my good friend, as I offer you your son with all the merits of his passion and death. And as the priest elevated the host into the air, he saw his friend like with a blaze of light being delivered from purgatory up into the glories of heaven. So my friends, what is the main sufferings of the soul in purgatory? Longing to see God. And we can help them by offering our prayers, our good works, and the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So let's do that. Linked at the end of this video, we have the Chaplet of St. Gertrude and the Litany for the Faithful Departed. Also the, uh, the Chaplet of Mercy, Divine Mercy linked in the description. And also, hey, share with me what stood out to you below in the comments. I really do love hearing from you. And thank you so much for your time. God bless you. Bye.